the choir is going to sing a song this morning that includes all of the uh, the anthems of our military branches. And as we sing your anthem, uh, say the Army or Navy or Air Force, whichever Marines, uh, Coast Guard, uh, we want those who serve to stand. If you uh, serve in one of those branches of military, um, if you have a family member who's not here that has served in one of those branches, you can raise your hand if you'd like. Uh, but if you if you were in the military or still active in the military, we'd like you to stand as we sing your anthem. Okay.
thank you, choir. Thank you to all of you who have served our nation from the depths of our heart, and uh, we, we, we certainly appreciate you. And, and those who are serving today, if you were out in the foyer a while ago, I, I was. Uh, where, where's Mason at? Mason, where are you at? There he is. Mason was standing over there by the table, and, and uh, his daddy's picture is, is up there. And he's currently serving, I think, over in South Africa or someplace. And, uh, and he's pointing to everybody that come along and said, that's my daddy. And, uh, and, and, and uh, I know that he's grateful as, as we are, not only for those who have served, but those who are also currently uh, serving today. Take your Bible to 2 Kings. 2 Kings, 2nd chapter. I just noticed on the order of service that the wrong outline may be on this screen behind me. Hit the, hit the first screen of the outline. No, that's his right. I sent you the wrong one. So the wrong title was on the, uh, was on the order of service, so I sent Eddie the wrong, the wrong thing for the bulletin. We, we've been for the past several weeks making our way, kind of following along through the, through the life of Elijah, and, uh, and, and he, he's, he's one of them characters in the Word of God that he just almost appeared out of nowhere, and in 1 Kings, the 17th chapter, God called him out to go and confront Ahab, King Ahab, and tell old Ahab, he said, he said Ahab, it's not going to rain except at my word for three and a half years, and, and he did that. And, and then we, we talked about that, and we talked about how, how God moved him and sent him to the, to the, put him in isolation at the brook Cherith for a while. And, and then the week after that, in the 18th chapter, we talked about the fact that that everything that Elijah did, he had a passion. And, and his passion was not for his own notoriety, but his passion was for God's glory. That, that whatever he did and whatever happened in his life, that, that, uh, that, that, that he wanted God to get the glory. And then in the 19th chapter, we, we talked about how, what, and, and what a timely, pre prevalent message that it was that we that we learned to deal with failure. Last week in the 21st chapter of 1 Kings, we talked about how sometimes that we, we put God on trial in, in our own life with our thoughts and, and different things. So this morning, what I want us to do, and, and, and I, just, I, 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 just, I, I don't believe in coincidence or happenstance or luck or chance or any of those things. I, 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 believe, in, I believe in a sovereign God who has everything, everything, in his hands, in his timing, and, and I believe that, that this was to uh, sort of with, with the events of last week and, and you know, the, the shooting and the murders there at the church in, near San Antonio and, uh, and, and just the different things that are going on in life, I want to speak to you this morning, still from the life of Elijah, I want to talk to you about the most important thing that anybody will ever talk to you about in all your life. I mean, ever. Making preparation to meet God. Making preparation to meet God. There was a, there was a book written almost 10 years ago. In fact, it was published in the fall of 2008. And, and one of the co-authors of that book was a gentleman by the name of Dave Freeman. And, and the name of this book was this, 100 Things to Do Before You Die. Well, this book inspired a movie. Some of you have seen this movie. I think Morgan Freeman was one of the stars in the movie, and it was the movie called The Bucket List. Well, it got its, it got its birth and its origination and its idea from this book that Dave Freeman co-authored. And Dave Freeman and whoever his writing friend was, they sat down and they began to compile a list of a hundred things that, that everybody needs to do before they die. Well, well, they come up and they, they listed a whole list of things. They included things like attending the Academy Awards and, and, and they took about making trips to this land and that land and this nation and that nation and to go to this ballpark and that ballpark. And, and, and Dave Freeman wanted to run with, I think it's called Running with the Bulls in Pamplona, Spain. I could run with a bull in Lufkin, Texas if I wanted to run with a bull, but I don't care much about it. 
and, and, and he put all of these things on, on, on his list. But the ironic thing about this is that at the age of 47, Dave Freeman took a fall, he hit his head, and he died from the lick on his head. So therefore, he didn't complete the hundred things that, 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 that he had written in his book that he ought to do. But one of the, one of the things, and I don't know that Dave Freeman knew this until he entered into eternity or not, but, but, but one of the things that Dave Freeman and his co-author neglected on their list was to prepare to meet God. I tell you this morning that every one of us, and there are no exceptions, we are going to meet God. It's just going to happen. Now what we do in this time that we have that we call our, our life is this time is a time to make preparation for that time because we don't have any choice in the matter of whether we're going to meet him or not we're just everybody's going to we just need to make certain that we're prepared to meet God and listen this idea of meeting God is not something new it, it, it's been going on all through the all through the course of time just just in, in in the same book that we're reading from this morning we'll we'll read in chapter 2 but but o, over in the 20th chapter let, let me just read you the first verse of that chapter. The, the, the Bible says there, In those days Hezekiah was sick and near death. And, and the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, went to Hezekiah and said to him, Thus says the Lord, Set your house in order, for you shall die. And not live. Then in Amos, the fourth chapter and the twelfth verse, the Bible tells us this Therefore, thus will I do to you, O Israel, because I will do this to you prepare to meet your God, O Israel. If I could give you one word of advice, and if I were ever to give any what we call sage advice in my lifetime, my advice to you would be to prepare to meet your God. I want you this morning to turn with me to the second chapter of 2 Kings. And we're going to read the first 14 verses. And I'll preach from this text this morning, sharing with you four things that we need to do in making preparation to meet God. Let's stand together as we read this passage of Scripture. It begins this way, And it came to pass, when the Lord was about to take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind, that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. Then Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me on to Bethel. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. Now the sons of the prophets who were at Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that the Lord will take away your master from over you today? And he said, Yes, I know. Keep silent. Then Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me on to Jericho. But he said, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. Now the sons of the prophets who were at Jericho came to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that the Lord will take away your master from over you today? So he answered, Yes, I know. Keep silent. Then Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me on to the Jordan. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. And fifty men of the sons of the prophets went and stood facing them at a distance while the two of them stood by the Jordan. Now Elijah took his mantle, rolled it up, and struck the water. 
and it was divided this way so that the two of them crossed over on dry ground. And so it was when they crossed over that Elijah said to Elisha, Ask, what may I do for you before I am taken away from you? And Elisha said, Please let me a double portion of your spirit be upon me. So he said, you have asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if you see me when I am taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if not, it shall not be so. Then if this were a movie, the music would change. And we would know that the scene was about to get dramatic. And it says in verse 11, it says, then it happened. As they continued on and talked that suddenly a chariot of fire appeared with horses of fire and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it. And he cried out, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and its horsemen, So he saw him, Elisha saw Elijah no more. And Elisha took hold of his own clothes and tore them into two pieces. He also took up the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and went back and stood by the bank of the Jordan. Then he took the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and struck the water and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he also struck the water, it was divided this way and that, and Elisha crossed over. You can be seated. This passage of Scripture today, it focuses not just on the life of Elijah, but it it focuses on the last day. The last day. You know, when, when, when we think about the last day of anything, I remember as growing up as a kid, you'd get to the last day of school. And you know on the last day of school, you weren't going to do anything. You know, you, you, you're going to play games and go outside and do all of these things. And, and, and then, you know, I'm, I'm getting old enough now where, where I'm, I'm not ready for it, but, but I, can, I can, in the, in the mirror, in, in the distance, I can see that, that time of, of what we call retirement. And, and you see that. And, you know, when we get to the last day, I've been to people's last day on their job, and they'll have a party for them and, and a celebration to honor them and all of those things. And, and, and then we just think about, you know, if, if this were my last day, I wouldn't worry about anything. I'd probably go in, and I'd pour me a big glass of sweet tea, and I'd go back on the back porch, and and I'd just listen to the birds sing and, 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 and watch the deer come in and eat grass on the back part of the, on the, back part of the property. Or, or, or I, would, I would do something like that. I, I, want you, I want you to pay attention this morning to how we ought to spend our last day. And, and, and we're going to find that our last day, and, and by the way, we don't know when our last day is. But we ought to spend today as if it were going to be our last day. We ought, to, we ought to spend our last day following these four steps to make certain that we're prepared to meet God. Here's number one. Face the facts honestly. Face the facts honestly. This goes back to verse 1. And it came to pass when the Lord was about to take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. Now here's what happens. This verse tells us, okay, that the sovereign God, okay, now understand he is not the big man upstairs. He's not the grand poobah. He is the sovereign God of all this world. Everything in this world, he is the sovereign God. Well, on this day in Scripture, the sovereign God is about to usher Elijah into his presence. Not in the way that he had ushered people into his presence before, but he was going to do so in a supernatural way. In fact, if you know your Bible very well, then you know that Elijah is going to be only the second person in all of history that would go to heaven without dying. 
And, and, and if you're familiar with your Bible, you know that in Genesis, the fifth chapter, we read about a gentleman by the name of Enoch, and he was number one. We're not talking about Enoch today. But here's, here's what I want you to know this morning. Chances are you and I are not just going to be ushered out of this world without dying. Save the rapture. That, that could be. But other than that, chances are we're going to have to die to get to go to heaven, okay? So, so you say, well, Brother Steve, what, what are the facts that we need to face? There are two of them, and, and they're quick. Here's the first one. Your life will end down here. Your life will end down here. Hebrews 9 and the 27th verse says this, and this speaks of every one of us. It is appointed unto man. And man is not speaking of the, of the male species. Man is speaking of every man, woman, boy, or girl who has ever lived. The Bible says it is appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment. You say, well, why do we die? Do we die because we get old? No. It's not why we die. We die because we're sinners. We have disobeyed. We have disdained. We have, we have ignored. We have shunned. We have forsaken the will and the word of God as a society. And the Bible says this in Romans, the sixth chapter and the 23rd verse. It says that the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. So trust me this morning, we don't need to discuss it. We don't need to go home and pray about it. You can just trust me this morning that you will not live forever. We just won't do it. One day, could be today, one day we will draw our final breath. And I would that I could tell you it will happen in whatever the median age is in America today. And it's somewhere, it's in the upper 70s. It's probably nearer 80 than it is 75 nowadays. And we would like to think, well, I'm not near that old. In fact, Brother Steve, I'm not near as old as you are. But I tell you this morning, we don't know when it's going to occur. But I tell you this morning from the authority of the Word of God that one day you will draw your last breath. And one day you will meet God. One day you will meet Him. You will either meet Him as your Savior or you will meet Him as the judge. And the Bible tells us that God has turned over the judgment. It tells us this in John's Gospel. It tells us that God the Father has turned over judgment to Jesus the Son. So we're going to stand before him one day, and we'll either stand before him as our Savior, or we will stand before him as our judge. Well, what's the other fact, Brother Steve? So your life is going to end here. Well, the second fact is this. Your lifespan is uncertain. Your lifespan is uncertain. The, 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 the fact of the matter is this. We don't know when we will die. We, we just absolutely don't know. Nor do we know if, if we happen not to die. We don't know when Christ is going to return. We, we, we're, we're given some things to look for. And he tells us, he says, when you begin to see these things come and you begin to see these things appear, he said, then know that my return is soon. But that's about as close as we get. So we don't know when we're going to die. We don't know when, when Jesus might come. But listen to what the Bible says in James 4, 13, 14, 15. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell and make a profit. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. And then it, it, a, 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 a very pointed question, it says, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. So instead of assuming or presuming on the things that he mentioned in verse 13 and 14, he says in, in verse 15, he says, instead you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will do this or that. Let me give you a sobering thought this morning. 
Okay, you say, well, you're not much cheering us up today. I'm, I'm just going to tell you the truth. In, in this world today, in our world today, somewhere between 150 and 200,000 people will draw their last breath. Between 150 and 200,000 people will draw their last breath. Just to break that down and so you get the enormity of this situation, that is one person every one and a half seconds. One just died. Another just died. Another just died. Every one and a half seconds, somebody dies. Along about this hour just, just seven days ago, here in, here in the great state of Texas, that this, this guy walked in this church in, in Sutherland Springs and, and, and little did anybody know probably about the moment seven days ago, but in about ten minutes from right now, seven days ago, everybody knew. They, were, they, they could have been singing victory in Jesus or how great thou art or whatever. They, they may have been sleeping through church, which I know nobody would dare do here. But I'm going to tell you, moments later, they drew their last breath. I tell you this morning, there is not a single one of us who knows when we will or, or might or might not step from this world into the world of eternity. So what we need to make certain of this morning is that we are prepared to meet God. Are you prepared? What's the second thing? We need to face the facts honestly and we need to serve the Savior relentlessly. We need to serve the Savior relentlessly. Now, I'm not going to reread this, but, but, but this covers from verse 2 down through verse number 10. And all of Elijah's life has been centered on his relationship with the one true living sovereign God. That's, that, that's, been, that's been pretty well what his life is, has been about. In fact, his name means my God is Yahweh. That, that's, what, that's what his name means. So, so when we think about serving the Savior relentlessly, I, I want you to notice, and, and again, we're talking about the last day of his life. I, I, want, I want you to think about some things that happened on, on this particular day. I, I want us to think about his submission to God's authority. Now, we, we can go back over the course of his life as we've looked at it in these past several weeks. When God spoke to Elijah, and he said, Elijah, I want you, after he went to Ahab that first time, said it's not going to rain for three and a half years. And when God spoke to Elijah and said, Elijah, I want you to go to the brook Cherith. And he said, I'm going to provide for you there by the ravens. They're going to bring food in every morning and every evening. What did Elijah do? He obeyed God. When God told him to leave there, and when God told him to, to, to leave the brook Cherith because the brook dried up, and he told him to go to a place called Seraphath. And over at Seraphath, God was going to provide for him not by the ravens, but he was going to provide by the means of a widow woman. What did Elijah do? He obeyed God. There's a theme here. Catch it. When, when, when God told him to go and challenge the false prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel, what did he do? He obeyed God. When, when God told him to pronounce the upcoming death of King Ahaziah, he obeyed God. In, in, in the passage that we read this morning, when God told him to go to Bethel, he obeyed. When God told him to go to, to Jericho, he obeyed. When God told him to go to Jordan, he obeyed. say, what does this have to do with us? We need to be living our life serving God relentlessly. Relentlessly. Listen, he was obeying God. Listen to me. He is obeying God. He is serving God relentlessly even though it's the last day of his life. So we think about his submission 
to the authority of God. Then we think about his passion for, for God's glory. We, we, we picture him up there as we were at this place a few weeks ago as he stood there on Mount Carmel and he's challenging the prophets of Baal. He, and, and we remember that story. He not, only, he not only stood before them, but he even mocked them. He told them, he says, as, they were, as, as the prophets of Baal were crying out to the, to the little, little G Baal gods, he said, well, maybe, maybe your God's asleep. He said, maybe you need to go wake him up. Maybe he's taking a nap. That's what Elijah did. I, I'm telling you, he was, he was doing all of those things. And, and, and listen, when, when the hours passed and the time came and, 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 and the prophets of Baal were praying that fire would fall from heaven from their gods, and, and when nothing happened, oh, Elijah, he stood up there and he prayed. He prayed. And the difference in the prayers is he asked a living God. He asked the living, sovereign God of this universe to send down fire, to consume the sacrifice that he had prepared. And here's the way that he did this. It, it's, in, it's in 1 Kings, the 18th chapter, in the 37th verse. And, and, and the word, it, it might be here in your Bible or it could be answer. But it says this, it says, answer me, O Lord, hear me, that this people, all these prophets of Baal around me, that this people may know that you are the Lord God and that you have turned their hearts back to you again. I'm telling you, God's glory is what mattered to this great man of God, Elijah. The third thing about, about him serving the Savior relentlessly is his mountain-moving faith. His mountain-moving faith. In, in verse number 7, that we, we, I won't read it to you again, but, but even though this is the last day of his life, He's not sitting down. He's not sipping on a glass of tea. He's not kicking his feet up. He's not passing the time until he gets his gold retirement watch because the word retirement's not in his vocabulary. He, he's not about to quit on God. In fact, he's coming to the last day of his life like a sprinter that we would watch in the Olympic Games. When they get close to the tape, they, they lunge forward and they lean forward and they stick their chest forward so that they can get out there and get to the tape just a little bit sooner. And that's the way that Elijah comes. That's the way that Elijah comes here on, on, the, on this final day of his life. And, and, and listen, he must have challenged the, the, the prophets who were enrolled at the, at the, at the seminaries at, at, at both Bethel and Jericho. And he must have said to them, he said, fellas, this is the last day of my life. I'm soon to go to heaven to be with the Lord. That's soon going to happen. But when I'm gone, you be true to the word of God. You preach the word of God, and, and you proclaim the word of God. And then he come to the Jordan River on this day, and he come there, and, and, and the Jordan River served as an obstacle to what was Elijah's place of departure. And, and, and when he gets to the Jordan River, it's, this was not a time to say, well, the Lord will find me over here. This was not a time to sit back and, and, and to tell stories about the, about the mighty moves of God in his life. No, he was up to the challenge. He was up to the challenge. So even on the last day of his life, Elijah attempts great things for God. Do you hear me this morning? When was the last time you attempted something great for God? He not only attempted great things from God, for God, he expected great things from God. The passage of Scripture tells us that he smote the water. Now, I'm going to tell you, I don't know about you. And if you happen to be visiting with us, I, I, I want you to know up front that I believe that this is the inspired, infallible, and inerrant Word of God. And I believe with all my heart that every miracle entailed in this book happened. And I believe they happened just the way that he tells us that they happened. And, the, and this passage of Scripture tells us that Elijah took his mantle and he smote the water 
and God divided the water. It's not the first time God had divided water, is it? God divided the water. He divided the Jordan. And, and you know what happened? Elijah and Elisha didn't trample through the mud. You know what they did? Some of you are not going to believe this. I believe when they got to the other side, they might have had to wipe the dust off of their feet. I believe they walked across that thing on dry ground. So we see it. We see it in his submission to God's authority. We see it in his passion for God's glory. We see it in his mountain-moving faith. And we see it in, his, in, in verse 9 and 10 in his mentoring of Elisha. Now, you, you did catch that we're talking about two different people, Elijah and Elisha. God sends Elisha to Elijah. And, and, and Elijah is, uh, 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 he, he mentors Elisha. And, and, and Elisha, he, is, he was tenacious in following Elijah. He had a, he had a teachable heart. He had a teachable spirit. And, and listen, he had a call from God on his very life. Elijah. He knows he's getting close. He knows he's getting to this place where God's going to take him home. And so, so, so we must assume that, that, that along the way that, that Elijah gives some final instructions to his protege, to his understudy, to Elisha. And, and, he, and he tells him some things. And he says, and he says uh, Elisha, ask for whatever. Did you see what he asked for? He said, give me a double portion of your spirit. A double portion of your spirit. Listen, he's, he, he, he didn't ask for a worldwide cruise. He, he didn't ask for a new pickup truck. He didn't ask for some new shoes because he had, he had just walked all these miles. He didn't ask for a new wardrobe. He, he didn't ask for any of those things. Listen, he knew. Elisha knows this. Elisha knows that he is going to be leading the prophets as, as, as they sought to turn the nation back to God. So he asked God. He asked God to give him a double portion of, of Elijah's spirit. I'm telling you this morning, this is how to meet God. When we come to the end of the road, let's have all the I's dotted and all of the T's crossed. How many times have we been about to do something and make a trip and we say, well, I need to go back here and tie up all the loose ends. Listen, when we come to the end of the road, and today could be the end of the road, don't leave any loose ends. Be prepared to meet God. When we leave this world, and we go stand before God. We're not going to be able to say, well, God, I need to go back and make this right. I need to go back and do this and do this and do this. There's no coming back to finish up all the loose ends. There's no coming back to tell somebody that we love them that we should have already told. There's, there's no going back and apologizing for something we said about somebody or to somebody. There's no going back and doing those things. I'm telling you this morning, what, what we need to make certain of is we need to make certain that, that we've tied up all the loose ends. We need to make certain that, that just like Elijah, we have submitted to the authority of God. We have passion that, that God would be glorified in and through our life. We need to have a mountain-moving faith like Elijah had. We need to, those that are coming along behind us, we need to be mentoring them as we ought to let me give you the third thing to be ready to meet God and that is this determined to die triumphantly determined to die triumphantly this is that verse that began with those words then it happened here's what's going on E and E Elijah and Elisha they're, they're walking along and they're continuing on and they're talking I, I would like to know what the conversation was. I would like to know what they had discussed, and, 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 but they talked about things, and they knew what was, what was going to happen. 
Let's put this into our life. When we walk through the door of death, there's only two ways to walk through it. One, we will find ourselves in unimaginable glory, or we will find ourselves in unimaginable doom. One of the two. One of the two. There are only two destinies that are available. It's not a multiple choice question. It's heaven or hell. And, and, and nobody determines that for us. We determine that on our own. As the word of God is presented or, or, or given into our life and the invitation is given and, and, and it's you and I that make the decision. If the Holy Spirit of God, and I'm telling you the Holy Spirit of God is living. It is, he, is, he is one third of the living triune Godhead. And the Holy Spirit of God, if he speaks to your heart and he compels you and tells you that you're lost, you've never been saved, you, you've never asked Jesus to come into your heart and save your soul, if that's what he would be saying to you today, you need to respond. Well, why? You say, well, how do you know Elijah died triumphant? I think there are two, two reasons we know. One, he knew where he was going. He knew where he was going. I, I, I'm telling you this morning, there is not a shred of doubt in my mind. There is not a shred of doubt anywhere within me that, 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 that Elijah didn't know that when, when his time came, he was going to heaven. He was going to heaven. Listen, he knew that he was going to worship God face to face. Not by faith. We worship by faith. We, we all understand that? It, it's all by faith right now. But he knew that after, after, the, after this whirlwind came and he's taken out of this world and he's taken to heaven, he is going to be face to face with God. He is going to be in that place that we read about, that place of no death that place of no sorrow, that place of no pain, that place of no sickness, that place of no separation, that place that has streets of gold, that, that, that the worship, my goodness, we, we, we can't decide on worship down here. Some of us want to sing, sing this kind of music and some want to sing this. Some of us want to clap and some of us don't want to clap. Some of us want to stand up. We don't want to stand up. I'm telling you, worship in heaven, you're not even going to have a decision in the matter. Some of you come and say, well, I just think I'll sleep through Brother Steve's sermon today. You won't sleep through worship up there. Now, the worship's going to be glorious. It is going to be an eternity of fulfilling service to God. It's going to, there's going to be joy unspeakable and full of glory. There's going to be pleasures forevermore. And I'm telling you this morning, you can't die triumphantly with how much money you've got in the bank. The only shot of dying triumphantly is dying knowing Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. That's the only way. Elijah knew where he was going. Now, let me give you the second thing about this dying triumphantly. He knew why he was going. He knew why he was going to go to heaven. He wasn't going to go to heaven because of, just because he had gone to these places where God told him to go. He wasn't going to go to heaven because he, would, he had been a good prophet. He wasn't going because he had been a good mentor to Elisha. It was a part of God's plan for his life. But none of those things were going to get him into heaven. Elijah was going to go to heaven because he had put his faith in God. No other reason. Not because the church he might be a member of, not because of the position he held. Listen, I'm telling you today, and, 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 and it's the same truth. Today, what, what is today's date? November the 12th, right? November the 12th, 2017, at 1137 a.m. There is only one way to go to heaven. One way. The Bible tells us that way in John 14, verse 6. Jesus said to him, I'm the way. 
I am the way. Then he says, the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. 1 Peter 3.18, for Christ also died once for sins, the just for the unjust. Now listen to this, that he might bring us to God. You don't hear anything else. You hear this this morning. He is the only way to heaven. The only way to heaven. I'm telling you this morning, if you're here and you've never been saved, would you repent of your sins and place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ because he is the only one who can bring you to God. He's the only one. He enables us to die triumphantly. We're going to die, period. We're just going to. But he enables us to die triumphantly. Here's the fourth thing. So we see we face the facts honestly. We serve the Savior relentlessly. We determine to die triumphantly. I almost just left this off, but I think it's important. Leave a legacy deliberately. Leave a legacy deliberately. Now, this is verse 12, 13, and 14. Now, if you were to ask, how, how, what, what sort of legacy does, does Elijah leave? Well, I, I think it's a twofold legacy. One, verse 12 talks about it. He left a legacy of godliness. He left a legacy of godliness. Now, if, if we were, if, and there's no way that we could do this, but I, I just feel safe to say that Elijah's contributions to the kingdom of God they were off the chart. I'm telling you, they were, they were, they were just totally off the chart. He, he stood courageously against some of the most wicked, vile leaders that, that, that had ever, ever risen to power. And, and, and he stood courageously before them. He never backed down. He, he, he never compromised the word of God. Let me ask you this morning. Are you laying the groundwork? Are you laying the foundation for a legacy of godliness? We all realize there's people coming along behind us. We, we, we all realize that. There's people coming behind us. And it's not, we, we, we see and we know that we, we have our children coming along, but there's just other people that are watching you. There's other people that are listening to you. And they're, and, and they're listening to your conversations. They're, they're hearing the jokes you tell. They're, they're, they're hearing and they're observing all of these things. And as those things are happening, what you're doing is you're laying a groundwork. It's the groundwork and the foundation that you're laying, a foundation and groundwork of godliness. When that time comes, as Hebrews 9.27 says, it's appointed unto man once to die. When you die, and folks are gathered for your service, are they just going to have to stand up and tell stories about what a good old boy he was? Are they just going to have to say, well, he was a hard worker. Bless his heart, he loved that, he loved that baseball and he loved that football. Or are they going to be able to stand and proclaim of your life godliness? I'm going to be honest with you. Perfect, not in any way, shape, form, or fashion. I want to be a good father. I want to be a good husband. I want to be a good grandfather. I want to be a, I want to be a good friend. But when I leave this world, I want to work hard, and I do. But when I leave this world, I desire to have left behind a legacy of godliness. That's, that's the desire of my heart, to leave a legacy of godliness. So Elijah, he leaves this legacy of godliness, and, and he also leaves a legacy of faith. 
in that, in that 13th and 14th verse, we find Elisha. Elijah's gone. Elisha has Elijah's mantle. And, and, and he cries out. He cries out for the God of Elijah, sovereign creator God. He calls out for the, for the God of Elijah to do a miracle. Where, where did he get this from? He saw Elijah, didn't he? He heard Elijah. And I'm telling you, Elisha called out for the, for the God of Elijah to do a miracle. And you know what? He did. He absolutely did. And I'm telling you, what a, what a, we, we, we don't have time to follow him out this morning, but what a man of faith Elisha becomes. Don't leave behind a legacy of idleness. Don't leave behind a legacy of complacency. Don't leave behind a legacy of lukewarmness. Don't leave behind a legacy of I, I wished I would have or I ought to have. Leave, leave a legacy of faith. Leave a legacy of faith and be a fruitful believer. Strive to be a believer who makes a difference for the kingdom and the honor and the glory of God. I'm telling you this morning, pre preachers weren't given to be the people that make a difference in society. You're to make a difference in society. I am, I am to make a difference. But every one of us, we're to make a difference. We're to live different. We're, we're a peculiar people. Prepare to meet God. That's the challenge that's placed before us this morning. And I'm telling you this morning, you say, well, he must be just about done. I'm on, I am. But I'm going to tell you this. I'm going to tell you this. It's a challenge we need to take seriously. It is a challenge that we need to take seriously. People oftentimes come up to us and they say, how are you doing or what are you doing? A lot of times I answer that with this. Because you, you know they don't really, yeah, I don't mean this ugly, but they, they don't really want to know everything that's going on in your life. And we, we, we understand that. So oftentimes I answer that question with the same old, same old. Same old, same old. I'm telling you, I believe this morning, that if we would live life making preparations to meet God by facing the facts honestly, serving the Savior relentlessly, determining could die triumphantly, and leaving a legacy deliberately, I believe that it would cure the same old same -os. I believe that it would cure the common life. I'm, I'm telling you this morning, over and over through this message, over and over through our lives, over and over the, through God, God has, God gives us word. And, and I believe that the Holy Spirit reiterates this statement that we've heard this morning, prepare to meet God. I was at three funeral services this week. And at those funeral services, that phrase was never spoken. But as I sat in my spot or I, I stood in my spot in those services, it, it was as if the Spirit of God says, Steve Cowart, you prepare to meet God. I looked into the Word this week, and, and I, I prepared to preach and, and to come this way. And, and as I read these things and seen this event again in the life of Elijah and, and, and Elisha as his, as his sidekick here in this passage of Scripture, the, the Word of God spoke again, prepare to meet God. I'm older today than I've ever been at any point in time in my life. And you know what that says to me, Steve Cowart? Prepare to meet God. I'm telling you this morning, we need to make preparation to meet God. We're going to meet Him. How we meet Him, that's up to us. How we meet Him is up to us. If you're here this morning, and today is your day to meet God, and you don't know 
the Son of God, Jesus Christ, as your personal Savior, you will not enjoy the meeting. But you can place your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ today. And you can meet him. And it will be a glorious, glorious meeting for all of eternity. This morning in this invitation, the Spirit of God says to each one of us, young and old, prepare to meet God. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your challenge to our life. Lord, in this invitation, you know our hearts. You know where we stand with you. You know where we're headed if we were to enter into eternity in the, in the same spiritual condition that we are at this very moment. You know the saved from the unsaved. You know those that have been redeemed and those who've not. Lord, this morning, if your spirit is dealing with our hearts. May you give us courage and boldness to step out and come and to place our faith and our trust in you to be our Savior. Lord, let every one of us in this room make preparation to stand before and meet a sovereign, holy, loving God. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing.